Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. I suppose it's not morning for you, um, but welcome to 7am on Saturday morning in New Zealand. Uh, my name is Laura Belmain, and I'm going to be with you for the next 35 to 40 minutes. Um, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. So thank you for having me. Um, I'm just going to set a few ground rules. Remote conferences are a bit strange. I'd love to be in the room with you physically, but uh, obviously we can't do that. So um, the chat box at the side is your friend. Uh, just so that I know at least one person is alive in here other than me, if you wouldn't mind just saying hello in the chat, that makes me feel a little bit less weird and lonely. But if not, we will just get on. So my name is Laura Belmain. As I said, I'm the CEO and founder of SafeStack, and I'm going to be here with you today uh, talking about the exciting, or at least in my view, world of application security and how we need to build the biggest security team the world has ever seen to fix it. And hopefully, I want you to be part of it, but, you know, spoilers to the end. So, a little bit about me. Um, now, I have a bit of a strange background. Most people in security do. Um, and I think that's part of the joy of this space is we're all so diverse and we come from different places. I started out as a COBOL software developer when I was 16, which is not what the cool kids said that you should go and do. But here I am. Um, since then, I've done everything from AI and robotics to software for the LHC in Geneva, Switzerland, so radiation monitoring software. Um, I've worked for the British Intelligence Services in counterterrorism and counter online harm to children. Um, and I've been a penetration tester and then later a security consultant. Now, my family uh, is very uh, closely tied in with the veteran community. My brother uh, is a veteran from the Royal Mechanical Engineers in the UK. Um, and I spent a long, long time in my uh, intelligence days working alongside amazing people from the military community. So it's really great to be in front of this audience today. Now, a little bit of a disclaimer. Now, I'm using some of the themes from the last two years as um, a, an anchor, if you will, as a foundation for how we're gonna talk about AppSec now, um, oh, there's an announcement, one second. Um, please note, I do not mean any disrespect. The last two years have been pretty brutal for a lot of people. And I do not want to make light of or in any way harm uh, any kind of individuals who have been particularly affected by this. So please note, I'm using this because it's important to use the lessons that you learn from the world around you in constructive ways. I'm not doing it uh, to make light of it. So please let me know though if there are any concerns at the end. I'm always taking feedback on these things. So welcome to those just joining us. Don't worry, we've just done the preamble. I'm amazing, you're amazing, you look great and we're gonna get on with it. So 30 million, where's that number even come from? I said I'm gonna build a team of 30 million players. Well, there are 30 million software developers in the world right now. Now that might be some of you, some of you might do this full time. Some of you might do bits and pieces and just write a bit of code for fun. Some of you might not consider that being a software developer. I'm here today to tell you that whoever writes code, whether it is ugly code you wish would just go into the trash or it's code that gets to live on a server forever, I want you to own that because it's going to take all of us to build the software the world needs and it's going to take all of us to fix it as well. Now, excitingly, the world of software development grows at 1.2 million individuals every year. And that's a lot, that, that's a huge number. Now, why is that important? Because of the scale of the problem that we're trying to solve. Now, there's a few misconceptions. I'm an application security specialist, so I live in a very small niche of cybersecurity. Now, for me, saying I work in cybersecurity is kind of like saying I live in Europe or I live in the USA. It's a big place. And just because you live in Seattle doesn't mean that you have the same experience and life as somebody who lives in Detroit. Um, I'm guessing here I'm not American, but I hope I'm not insulting people here. Um, I'm from Europe. We have the same challenges. Now, in AppSec, there's this big misconception that we're already all doing this really well. And then we get horribly surprised when there's a breach and something goes wrong with one of our applications. In reality, though, our organizations aren't that mature at all. Only 2% of the code that we write is written by teams that we would consider to be really mature in application security. Another 
ish is those who are exploring. So they're trying a bit, they're, they're trying to figure it out, but they haven't quite got it into a coherent um, system or platform yet. And the rest of us, and I say us, you know, I'm learning every single day, 83%, 82%, lots are emerging. We don't know where we are. We're, we're, we're starting. Some of us are just understanding the concepts of the space. Some are just dabbling. But we are at the very beginning. And that means that there's a lot of work to do. And there's a lot of work we can all do, all of us here today. So let's get back to the COVID thing and why I've used this analogy. Now, about two years ago, well, in April 2020, when in New Zealand, where I live, we all started getting into lockdown for the first time. Most people started their COVID experience by going and, you know, baking sourdough or you know doing whatever hobby that they had when they were locked down and I know lockdowns were different around the world but in New Zealand we had pretty strict lockdown you weren't allowed more than five minutes from your home on foot which is not very far at all um while most people were having fun with sourdough I was looking at this and going hang on so you tell me if one person gets sick and they have contact with two people then they get sick and this exponential growth happens this looks like something I'm familiar with. This, to me, looked a lot like information security. It looked like vulnerability. It looked like what happens when you have somebody or a system that is compromised and all of the other systems around it are put in harm's way. And so instead of sitting down and knitting or doing whatever I was supposed to do, I started thinking, how can we learn from our COVID experience to create five different frameworks, five different activities we can do to improve the quality of all software so that we can hopefully, much like we did in COVID, reduce the impact of the harm that can be done by things like breaches. So that's what we're going to talk through today. There are five actions you can go and do today. Now, if you're in a software role, you can go and do them right now. If you're not in a software role, but you're just getting into the space, then there's going to be lots of things here that as you migrate through your career, you're going to be able to start to apply, whether it's in AppSec or in the broader cybersecurity space. So those initiatives we have are tracing, distancing, testing, prevention, and response. And I'm going to go through those, so don't worry. Uh, we'll get to them in turn. If you have any questions, feel free to use the little uh, panel at the side. There is a lot going on as a speaker, so um, I will get to them as soon as I see them. Um, and, you know, also, this is your conference. This is your experience. So you're not just here to see people like me. You're also here to connect with the other people in this chat. So feel free to have a chat. Get stuck in. Share your experiences because that makes it richer for everyone. So let's get on to our first initiative, tracing. Now, in New Zealand, we had these amazing posters. I'm going to share them because, you know, it gives you a bit of a view. Um, and we had an app. We had an app that everyone downloaded onto their phone, and it was built in about seven weeks. Now, if any of you have been in professional software development, building an app and deploying it to five million people in seven weeks is just unheard of. So massive kudos to the team in New Zealand who put this out. And, you know, getting people to actually use an app, also very difficult. But we managed to get 2.8 million registered users. Now, our total population of our entire country is just shy of 5 million. So if you take out old people and young people and those who don't use their mobile device as much, that's a pretty good track record. Now, what it helped us to do is understand when we'd been clear, when we'd been near to other people who'd been affected by COVID. Now, in software security, this is important, too, because in security, we tend to think we're the center of the universe, that the bad things only happen to us and that, you know, we our view of all of our protections is really on the things that we control, the code that we write, the systems we build. But in reality, our systems don't look anything like that. The code you build, the bit of you in the middle, is connected to hundreds of other pieces of code and technology. Now, this is a visualization. You can scan that little barcode there. I promise it's not going to send you anywhere nasty. Um, this is showing you a screenshot of what's called Amvanka. It's a visualization written in JavaScript's D3, a visualization library. And what it's showing you is the links between one package, so one piece of software, and all of the other things that are related to it. So these are packages that also call it. So one 17-line piece of software connects directly to 358 other libraries. Now, this doesn't take into account all of the projects like the code that we write that then uses one of these 358 libraries. 
Now, why is this relevant? Well, you remember that diagram where we had one person who sneezes and everyone gets sick? Well, this is the same thing. If one package in our ecosystem is harmed, such as this one down here, then we have a problem called transitive risk. The idea that that risk, that vulnerability can propagate through an entire connected ecosystem. Now, I was just showing you one ecosystem. I was showing you a visualization from NPM. So that's the Node JavaScript language uh, ecosystem. But when we build software, there are dozens of different languages we use. The ones on screen right now are our most commonly used. And as you can see from the numbers underneath each of those package manager names, they have a lot of different dependencies. So NPM has 2.3 million packages in it. Uh, I write in Python, so I look at Pippi, which is a uh, third column top uh, entry. So 446,000 packages. Now that means that, you know, that's like being contact traced or being connected to a lot of people when something goes wrong. Let's talk about why that matters. As I said, this is called transitive risk. Now, transitive risk is the thing you inherit from other people or other organizations or other systems or other code. And there's transitive risk all the way through security. Apologies for the strange light. The sun is literally rising here. So you're going to get the full uh, stripy experience, apparently. Um, so transitive risk is what we inherit from other systems. Now, you can control the code you write but you can't control these elements that give you transitive risk. And that's what makes security quite challenging. You're impacted and affected by all of these things outside of your sphere of influence. OK, so your software then looks a bit like this. The code you write in the middle and then all the things you connect to on the outside. My small company, for example, we have over 100 packages we connect to and 100 different vendors around that that we also uh, are reliant on or communicate with. Now, each one of those gives us risk. And as Evan is saying in the chat, and there's a, a really great piece of legislation coming through um, in the US about the Software Bill of Materials. So the idea being that we need to understand what our software is made of because we're vulnerable from it. And we're vulnerable from it in a way that's called, what we call in the security industry, a supply chain attack. But it's a fancy way of saying, why attack one hard to to attack thing when you can attack one thing and get access to many others. Let me explain. Now, in April this year, a company called Heroku, so Heroku is an American company owned by Salesforce, and they host uh, applications for a number of people. When I say a number, I mean 13 million applications. It's a pretty big deal. Of that, 9,500 of their customers pay for that service. Now, in April this year, they had a compromise. Now, if you compromise a hosting provider, such as Heroku or AWS or Azure or any of these shared services, you can potentially compromise anything that's on them. Same way if you compromise a library that all, all applications use, you can potentially compromise every application that uses it. So when Heroku had a, Heroku had a bad day, this wasn't just you know, 13 million hobby apps. People who host on Heroku include Citrix, so GoToMeeting and the video chat software we've relied on for the last two years. DNS Simple, so some of the underpinning technologies we build the internet on. Uh, if you can control DNS, you can really make a bad time for a lot of applications. ThinkMD, which is a frontline healthcare platform, so essentially healthcare notes, so um, really sensitive personal information. So this supply chain attack against one hosting provider, Heroku, has managed to give us an impact on 13 million applications. And this is huge, this is a big deal. Now, how can we get tracing and how can we turn this into a thing, a power for good for what we're doing? The first thing you need to understand is you need to understand what you're building your software from. Now, this is a picture of um, an open source cryptocurrency trading platform. I just Googled a random open source cryptocurrency trading program, assuming you're going to build some software that's going to use this. Please don't do that. It's a terrible idea. But let's assume anyway for fun. Now, how would you judge that this software was good to use? Well, you could do it by looking at the number of stars, I suppose. You could look at the number of commits it's had and pull requests, how active it is. But it's important that whatever checks you do, you consistently do them. So you make sure that every time you pull in a piece of software, you've evaluated it and said, hey, is this a good idea to use? Now, sometimes this can be done by automated tools, but a lot of the time we have to do this manually as well. 
we have to make a judgment call because this isn't black or white. It's not a defined art. There's no way to prove the existence of bugs. Uh, sorry, the absence of bugs is only a way to prove the existence of them. So if you see something that looks fine, it doesn't mean it's guaranteed secure. So when you're evaluating your libraries or any technology, I would love to think about these things. So does it have known vulnerabilities? How active is it? Is the culture of the project healthy? Do they have issues that have not been resi resolved? Is it on a suitable license? And then you're going to get into mapping out your ecosystem. So the step one of tracing, much like it was with COVID, is understand your relationships to other technology and software. And that way you can understand what your risk is from people compromising one or other of those pieces of your critical infrastructure. Next up is distancing. Now in COVID times, distancing meant a lot of staying apart from each other and staying home. We had these great posters, they were everywhere. You could not move without seeing one. And it was all about staying apart from each other, wearing a face mask, and you saw the same things. I've very recently been over to the US. I know your posters are still up in your airports. We'll keep apart. Well, how do we do that in software, right? We can't keep all of our software separated because then we would get none of the benefits of shared libraries and frameworks of being able to inherit each other's code. Well, I want to encourage all of you to become software architects. Now, you don't need to go to a trade school for this. You do not need to get a degree or a qualification. Being an architect is just choosing to be somebody who designs a system and supervises its implementation. So it's about being intentional with the way we build software. Because our software doesn't look like this anymore. Back in the day, and when I say back in the day, I mean way before computers, I'm talking, you know, House of Dragons, Game of Thrones, we've got castles to protect, not, you know, digital systems. Our systems looked a little bit like this. We would have a big hard border at the outside, and the closer you got to the center, the more valuable the things that were there. But our systems don't look like this at all. So when we're planning our controls, our architecture isn't just build a big wall around our system and hope it's fine. It's try and figure out how all of these interconnected parts work with each other and how we can control the relationships between them and make sure they're safe. Now, I want you to imagine for a second, now I do a lot of analogies, I don't apologize for it. Let's imagine wherever you are right now, there is a big brown bear, the type that you find say in the forest in Canada, not in New Zealand, we don't have that kind of mammal at all. We have one native mammal and it's a bat. So imagine there's a bear, and that bear is after something tasty. Let's assume it's, for the moment, honey and not eating you, because it gets a bit dark at seven o'clock in the morning to talk about anything else. Now, being an architect is about choosing the controls that stop your threat actor, in this case, a bear, getting to your thing of value. So in this case, a pot of honey. But that pot of honey could be data. It could be uh, money itself. It could be access to key sensitive systems. Your value is going to be different in every system. And as an architect, you understand that value and you understand the relationship of threats to it. Now, as an architect, you get to choose the controls. So, for example, we might choose to protect our honey by using a bear trap. Now, I'm in a really big empty office because it's very early on a Saturday morning. But if there was a bear coming through the door right over there right now, and I had to lay down bear traps, this is going to be a bit of a nightmare. Not only is it going to be really difficult for me to operate in here, but I'd need actually a lot of bear traps to make sure that my pot of honey was protected. So instead of just having what we would call preventative controls, so a bear trap stops the bear, we would also expand to things like detective controls. So these are things that help us identify a bad things happening and respond to it. And as a software architect in the security space, this is key to us, not just knowing that bad things can happen, but seeing when it happens. So in my office right now, I put cameras up so that at least if a bear did come through the door, I'm going to have some sort of alerting and warning. So being an architect is about choosing those controls and applying them in a way to separate the thing that's going to do you harm from the things that could be done. The harm could be done too. Wow. 7 a.m. is not good for words. Apologies, team. We've got this. Right. What I'm talking about here is called zero trust. Now, please don't get caught up in the hype that is marketing on zero trust. If you Google zero trust, it's going to take you down a rabbit hole of magic devices that are going to try and save your world. The simplest way to remember zero trust is with a smile and not with cynicism. Just think that everything in the world could possibly do you harm 
and everyone is going to get breached eventually. So assume that everything is sort of in trouble and just proceed accordingly. Now, that sounds very cynical and nihilistic at this time in the morning. But do you know what? It's actually kind of freeing. Because in security, if you accept that bad things are going to happen, and you can't be 100% secure, you don't have to stress about, do I need to care? You start planning your defenses. You start looking at things and going, OK, all right, I am here. I have a problem. There is a problem. It looks like this. I can't control that. But I can take steps around it to change the risks, to change the likelihood. Now, in AppSec, we have these kind of controls. We have preventative, detective, and responsive. Um, in ISO land, you might see responsive called corrective controls as well. And these are the types of things, as a security architect, you can start putting in place. When is it the right time to put a gem post in? When is it the right time to install a firewall versus doing some uh, sanitization or encoding of my data? And you get to line up as whichever combination of these controls across your architecture as makes sense. And that's what distancing is. It's about designing our systems, understanding the components and how they fit together, then choosing the right components of our security world to protect each one of those from the things that would do them harm. Now, this diagram here is from a great free open source um, Thing you can go and check out now. I'm going to give you some really great tips on where you can get started with this if you've never done security architecture in the software world before or threat assessment. So things you can go and check out right now, today, no cost, no tricks, no gimmicks. Um, OWASP Threat Dragon, which is a free tool for modeling systems. So you can draw your little diagrams that will help you do a threat assessment. The Threat Modeling Cookbook, which is what this diagram here was from. This is a set of predefined well uh, reviewed design patterns for creating software so if you're ever like well how do i build a payment system i've never done this before have a look at this because this is literally the design pattern for where you would put your controls if you're building a payment system and it's free uh, the threat modeling manifesto explains, explains to you why security architecture is important and why threat modeling as part of that is really key and then this last one is actually a big github repo uh, called awesome threat modeling and it is about 50 different resources you could get started with right now today if you wanted to understand more about threat assessment and security architecture so get stuck in um, I will share these slides afterwards if anyone is interested, so please do reach out. So if we're going to get started with distancing, we're going to design for security, we're going to embrace zero trust, and we're going to make architecture a team sport. We should be, don't do crime, but we should be planning the equivalent of a bank robbery or trying to figure out what would happen if a bear tried to steal our honey. Because by doing that together, we make all of our systems a lot more secure. So next up, testing. In COVID land, we know this. You got symptoms, you got tested. Great, we're, we're familiar. Now, how does this translate to our software development lifecycle? So this is our standard software development lifecycle, right? We go from having an idea over here through to deploying some code out on a server somewhere. Now, this, depending on the type of organization you are, could go in the period of just a few days. You know, we go from end to end, and in some places it could be months. Uh, in some places they deploy multiple times a day. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. What matters is that you're following a process and you can slide in some security testing at the right places. Now, at the moment, a lot of people, if they do their testing, they do it in step four, the one labeled testing. So I'm going to make a couple of suggestions to make that even better so that we can embrace our COVID thinking and test more frequently and get more value from it. So the first thing to note with our testing for software security issues is that we have two key types of testing we're talking about. Now, I'm parking penetration testing. Those of you who are doing pen testing as a career path or wanting to get into that, that is a different team sport. That's not something we do in the software world ourselves. That's sort of an outsource thing. But here's two things in the software team we could be doing to make those pen testers sweat. One of my missions in life is to make pen testers work really hard for their money. I love you. I love pen testers everywhere. Don't take this the wrong way. But I want to make it hard for them because they enjoy the challenge. So vulnerability scanning is what we could do first. This is the equivalent of you walking into a hardware store and on the way in, they check your temperature with one of those little head thermometers. Because checking your temperature in COVID times could be an indication you have a fever. And if you have a fever, you could be sick. Now, in our code world, running a vulnerability scanner does just this. It looks for a symptom that something could be wrong, but it doesn't tell you what that specific thing is. So it could say, hey, you've got an unprotected variable here, or you've got a suspected password in your code, 
But it can't confirm that. It can't tell you it's genuinely the case. You would have to then go and investigate to see what that symptom is telling you. We can do vulnerability scanning at any point in our life cycle, but I highly recommend looking at it from the point where you're doing implementation onwards. So running vulnerability scanners can be something you can do as part of your build or on a nightly basis or even on a weekly or monthly basis if you don't have as much time. Automated testing is where we write scripts that do specific tests for us. Now, in the medical world, this is the equivalent of getting a very specific rat test or a PCR test in COVID. So it's looking for a combination of flags and symptoms that look for a, com a confirmed specific issue, such as COVID. Now, in automated testing, that could be things like writing an automated test that tests the, autom the authentication system on your application. So the bit that checks the username and password. You could write a test or a series of tests that test that functionality and checks that the bounds are working, that, you know, you can't put a password in that is too short or too long, uh, though too long is a bit complicated, don't overthink it. You could look at where that password is coming out at the other end just to check that it's not coming out in plain text. And all of these things can be automated in some way. Automated testing done as frequently as possible is a superpower in software security because the more testing we have, the more chance we are we're going to spot this bad thing before it goes out into our production systems. So when can we do this testing? Well, there's a few things to bear in mind here. Um, now, if you're already in the software space, this will make more sense. If you're not in the software space, there's going to be some terms here I'm going to try and explain. But if there's anything unclear, please come back to me. So we can run them manually. We could just do it on demand. And if you're at the very beginning of your journey, you're just starting out in software, then doing it manually is just fine. There's some great free open source tools you can use for this. So check out things like OWASAP. Um, these are tools that you can go run when you want to, when you're ready to act on the information. We can run them in parallel. So that means if you've got an automated software deployment pipeline, we can run another pipeline alongside that does these security checks as we go and then check in every so often to see if the results are good. Now, that can be good because it doesn't slow down your development, but it can be bad that you've now got two places to manage. So bear that in mind. Finally, we can run them integrated. So if you have a CI CD pipeline, which is a continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline, basically an automation pipeline that keeps building your software and keeps putting it on the server uh, whenever you hit commit or, or go, whatever your button is labeled, we could put it in line. So before our code actually reaches anywhere sensitive at all, we can run security tests, which is wonderful. This is the equivalent of checking your temperature before you leave the house. If you've got a fever, then you may as well just stay home and just check you're going to be okay. So with our testing, the key messages here is there's different types of testing that give you different levels of confidence. Our vulnerability scanning gives us a light degree of confidence because it's not a comprehensive test, but it does give you an indication something's not right. With our uh, automated testing, they're much more comprehensive and they're going to give tell you specifically what is wrong. So use them at the right time in the right place. Now, there is a little list in the slides. Like I said, I'll share these at the end. Um, if you want to consider what to test for and looking at tools for this space, there's some things to consider. So how can you get started with this? Well, you can automate some dependency checking. Do you remember at the start, we said we'd have all of these things in our software bill of materials or this list of software our software is made of? Well, we can check all of those and just run scans against them. Fantastic. Easy. Job done. We can have a look at our legacy projects. So if you're working with any old systems, Go run a scan against them. You may not be able to fix them in the same way, but have a run. If you're just playing with code at the moment, you're just starting out, then run against that too, because learning security from day one is far, far easier than learning it once you've been doing it for 10 years. And then make it break. So when you finally got your head around security testing or vulnerability scanning, put it as close to your commit or your deployment as possible. So that if it finds a problem, it is going to stop things and alert you because you don't want to proceed if there's danger ahead. Next up, prevention. How are we doing? We're all good. Uh, if you are listening at home and want to just make sure you're alive and just doing a little bit of a health check here, there's a little emoji symbol down at the bottom. I would love you to post your favorite emoji or the one that's closest to your mouse, uh, just so I can see that there's people still here. I can see there's 30 people here, but you know, again, it's very quiet. There we go. Hello. See, I see you all beautiful people. Right. Okay. Number four. Let's talk about prevention. Now, I'm not here to talk about whether vaccination is a good thing or a bad thing. I am pro-vax, but this is not what we're here for. We're talking about in COVID times, 
prevention was vaccination for a great number of our people. So how do we take this lesson from COVID and we take it into our software? Well, it all comes down to patching. Now, patching is super easy, right? Yeah, of course it is. We're all super up to date all the time and we're so totally on top of our patching, it's not even an issue, except that it really is. Because patching is a nightmare for all of us. It's one of the security controls that we suggest the most often, just patch your stuff, but without the understanding that patching, particularly in software, is incredibly difficult. Now, if every piece of software you're using, every library, is uh, is something that can potentially give you harm and everything could have new versions, if you've got 50 libraries and things to update, that's a lot of work to do because you can't just hit auto update and go. You've got to check that library, check the change, how's that change going to impact you, and then roll it out. Now, if those changes are happening daily or weekly, this is a lot of work. That's why this doesn't work on the whole. Now, I'm going to give you some things to think about to prioritize this. This isn't just a lesson in just go patch stuff. It's here's what you're, you're going to struggle with, and here's how we need to think about it. Firstly, there are three situations where patching almost never works. Firstly, you're working on a legacy project. I started working on COBOL when I was 16. That was legacy 30 years ago. And yet, here we are. It's still going. That system still underpins a tax system. So if it's a legacy project, it may well be you can't patch it because if you take down that core banking system, somebody's going to be a little bit upset with you. It could be a breaking change. It's very rare in software that our changes are just security patches. So when a new version of software comes out, they don't just go, here's a security fix, go fix it. They go, here's a security fix and 27 other changes that are going to change other bits of your software stack. So if it's going to be a breaking change, you might not be able to roll it in because it could take 30, 40 hours of work to fix all of the things it's going to impact. And finally, there could be no patch available. So let's look at some strategies for where you can't patch for these kind of situations. What can you do instead? So first thing you could do is what we call forking and fixing. So forking means taking a copy of the code for yourself. Fixing means fixing the problem yourself. So if there's no patch available or the patch that's come is too big, you could take a smaller version or an older version and you could make the change yourself. Now, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Well, if you're super confident, it could be great. But guess what? as well as your own code, you've now inherited the responsibility for looking after this other piece of code too. So now you have two puppies that need to be uh, walked and fed every day. This isn't going to scale. So if you are going to do this, it can be a great short-term fix. But re please remember, if you forked and fixed, at some point, you've got to go back to the main version. So you've got to pay that debt. We could ignore it. Just go YOLO. What's the worst that could happen? That's fine, right? Security is not really a thing. It's just made up. Um, and sometimes, actually, you can ignore security vulnerabilities. Not all the time, but sometimes. The important thing with choosing when to ignore a patch is having done the assessment. Is this code used? Is this code exploitable in some way? Is this vulnerability genuine? Now, there was some really fascinating stats out of the National Institute of Standards and Technology this week that said only 10% of the CVEs that were uh, in the, the National Vulnerability Database are considered to be exploitable. Now, that's interesting because there are tens of hundreds of thousands of uh, vulnerabilities in that database. It's massive. If you haven't been to have a look, go have a look at the National Vulnerability Database. It's amazing. But if only 10% are exploitable, then there's a very good chance we might be able to just put that update in later and control that flow a little bit. We could just change the library. You know, this is a bold move. Hey, there's, there's problems in my SQL database. I'm going to no longer use SQL anymore. But please remember... There's no such thing as a secure technology. For those of us who are old enough to remember when uh, Apple became Macs and there was those TV adverts with PCs versus Macs on them, where there was a really smug guy saying, you know, I'm more secure and I'm a Mac, and then there was the PC guy looking a bit nerdy. Well, back in the day, there were genuinely less Apple exploits. There were less Mac exploits, and that's because there were less people using that technology. It didn't mean it was secure. It just meant there were less people looking. Remember that changing a library or technology doesn't necessarily mean you're more secure as a result. It just means that you're changing your problem space. Uh, so think about that change very, very carefully. So when you're looking at prevention, when you're looking at patching and updating, I want you to look at edge cases, not just can I patch it. Patching is great. If you can do that, go do it. But if you can't do it, then have a look at what your other options are. 
it could well be that your solution is instead of fixing the issue where it is, but is to wrap it in a, other controls. Things like we learned in the distancing section when we talked about being a software security architect. So what we need to do, we need to define a patching policy and then follow it. Um, and if you can't follow it, then it's probably not the right policy. So have a look at edge cases, look at those legacy systems, look at those things that are gonna cause you pain and understand why you can't. Automate it where you can. I am a very lazy person and proudly so. Be efficient. One of my first mentors um, back in my intelligence days was a guy who used to work with the Marines a lot in the UK. And he said to me, Laura, automation is going to be your best friend in security because you're going to have these boring jobs to do every single day. And you want to make sure you do them absolutely precisely every single time. You want to do them spot on, no mistakes. And humans are really bad at doing boring things and making no mistakes. So automate it. If you don't like patching, if you don't like a boring security job, automate yourself out of it. It's the career skill I wish that I'd embraced earlier. And define your exceptions and then work around them. So finally, response, don't worry, we're doing really well for time. And there will be a little time for Q&A at the end. If anyone has any questions, this is your time to start thinking about them. So response. So in COVID, we had these, um, well, we had the one on the left. That's our COVID isolation plan. So every household got delivered one of these. It was like an incident response plan for if someone in your house got sick. Now, on the other side, um, oh, that's very sweet, Mark. Thank you. Uh, on the other side is a bit more familiar. So if you fly with any airline, you will see these very often. So this is an airline safety card. But this is also a form of incident response plan. And I'm encouraging you in this section to build an instant response plan. Now, if you're really graphical, you could do a cool one like New Zealand does here. Um, but if you're like me and you're not that graphical, then we'll stick with words. But how are we going to do it? Well, an instant response plan is a plan you follow in case bad things happen. That's it. Now, in your wider organization, in broader cybersecurity, that can include things like ransomware, somebody's lost a device, somebody's device is stolen, uh, we get a virus. But in application security, the bit I live in, then this is the set of vulnerabilities and incidents that can exist squarely in the software you build. And it's going to be a subset of the broader incident response plan. Now, incident response plans are quite I find them very, very useful because I like having a plan in case of emergency. But they always have four stages. They have identification. So know a bad thing is happening. Seems pretty logical, right? You can't respond and trigger your plan if you don't know that's happening. Verification. Check it's happening. So is this thing legitimately a problem? Now, you might consider this if you look at your background. For any of you who are veterans joining us today, if any of you ever did triage training or battlefield um, first aid, this is where I learned a lot of my verification was the idea that you had to have a review, check it really was an issue, and you had to make some sort of priority call on how you're going to address it. Next up, we have containment. So how can I stop the bad thing happening? So how can I stop the thing from bleeding, for example? Or how can I stop this problem getting worse? And then remediation, how do I address this? Now, remember that remediation doesn't exist on its own as a final step. It's only ever a loop to get you back to verification because you have to check that that thing has, <laughs> has um, oh, awesome, good to know that I'm not the only one who's been through that training. Um, so that remediation has to go back to verification because we have to check that we actually fix the problem because just because you put a Band-Aid on it does not mean you address the problem. So that's an instant response plan. You know this stuff already because you've done it in other places. All we're doing is we're applying it to the software world. So let's think about an example. So in identification, say, for example, we run an application and there's been a phone call to our call center. Hey there, um, I think my account's been compromised. And I can see suspicious transactions on it. OK, so we've had our identification. We've got somebody from our support desk has said, hey, there's, there's a problem here. Now, at this point, we get into verification. Is it a big problem? How big is it? So we start asking questions like, well, how many calls has there been on this? Is it just this one person? How long has it been going on? And we start looking for the information so we can make a judgment call. When we start getting in containment, if it's one person, it might just be that we lock out their account and just check what's going on. But if we find there's been 200 of these calls in the last hour, we might have a bigger issue. So our containment step might be much broader. And our remediation step will differ as well based on the scale and size. For example, if this issue is caused by one user having a poor password choice, then our remediation step would probably be to educate the user and to make sure that we're giving prompts so that people choose good passwords to start with. 
But if the issue is 200 people's accounts have been compromised by some form of automated attack, our remediation might be very different. And incident response planning allows you to come up with these scenarios, this granularity, and have a plan. And that plan can just be a checklist. That's fine. I'm a minimum viable uh, documentation sort of girl, which means I write exactly the right amount of documentation I need to solve a problem, but no more, because pretty PDFs are just a waste of everyone's time. So how do you get good at this? Well, firstly, gather your people. Incident response doesn't happen with an individual. You need a team. So you need some people from your software team. You need security people. You need some people from ops, some people from marketing, some people from customer support. And you come together and you talk through these scenarios. You create some plans, and I do it one plan at a time, so one scenario at a time. You then test it. Now, that's like doing a simulation. You sit down in a room and say, hey, we're going to pretend right now that we've had a call to our call center that's for this type of response. And we're going to test that plan. We're not just going to talk about it. We're going to go and find the logs we would need to find. We're going to go and do the process because that allows us to see, would this work in real life? And when we realize that things will work and don't work and we get those to-do lists at the end, we learn from those and we update our plan. And that's incident response planning. Um, and whether it's for a pandemic or whether it's for protecting your application, incident response planning is an awesome and incredibly crucial part of your security tool set. I would actually argue that in most roles, the most important first document you can ever build is your incident response plan, because you can almost always guarantee that something bad will happen one day. Um, so you're going to need that one. The rest, you're going to get to it in time. Start with your incident response. So have a crack, have a go at documenting an incident response plan. Test your plan with real team people and, and have a see how you go. Review your plan frequently. It's perfectly okay to you just to have one or two scenarios right now and just build it up with time. This tool, this incident response plan, is really, really important for your understanding, not just what you would do if something went wrong, but remember your training from your background. Having a plan means you don't panic under stress. It means you act in a coordinated and repeatable way, in a way that's going to minimize the impact of the event and get you back and up and running as quickly as possible. This is where your background is going to be a superpower. So... All of these things, tracing, distancing, testing, prevention or response, have all come from a really bleak two years. You know, there was incredible harm to people, and I'm not going to understate that. But let's see this as an opportunity to take some messages from things that have directly impacted all of us and apply it to the way we build software. And if we do that, then perhaps we can embrace the idea that to keep ourselves safe and the software we build safe, we need to keep all software safe. And to do that, this shared sense of mission and purpose, we need a team of 30 million people. And so I guess my call to action for all of you joining me today is come and join the team. You don't have to be a 10-year veteran of software development to be part of this team. You just have to want to make sure that all the amazing technology we're building today that's changing the world in Un unspeakable ways. So from sending people to Mars to robot doctors to little tiny patrolling robot pups and everything in between. If you care about that, then join this team and let's see if we can turn some bleak lessons from a bad period into something positive that will improve the quality of all of our software going forward. So these are my contact details. You can find me here. You can also find me on Twitter and on LinkedIn. I do welcome your invites to connect on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to chat. Um, your questions are welcomed in the Q&A tab or in the main chat tab if you're just, you know, feeling that way. We have a couple of minutes remaining and I'll hang around if there's any questions. And if not, it's been wonderful to see you all today. Thank you so much for uh, your comments in the chat. It made me feel less alone. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you. <laughs> Mark, you wanted to be a medical virus hunter. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a long, long time ago when I was studying, I sat in a lecture um, about it was a very old school attack against Amazon back when Amazon just sold books. And um, I wanted to be the police of the Internet. That's what I decided that day or, uh, you know, 18 or whatever it was. And it's amazing how some of us, you know, we're just wired in that way. We, you know, whether you, you've got an urge to be a, a medical professional or the armed forces or law enforcement or intelligence, um, it all translates across. And we've, we've got the same mindset. We just apply it to different fields. 
Any other comments or questions? Awesome. Well, lovely to meet you all today. I'm going to wrap this up for today then. Uh, we're, I think, exactly on time. Uh, uh, thanks, Tom. Yep, for those of you who are on this who don't know, SafeStack, my company, we provide uh, free access to all of our training for members of VetSec. So if you do want to come and take some courses, please contact Tom and the team and they will help get you set up. Um, and please reach out. Don't be strangers. Uh, if I can support your journey, wherever that takes you, please let me know. Take care.